Welcome to Interview from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. As the whole world knows, on September 19th, a major earthquake struck Mexico City that caused the collapse of buildings throughout the city, damaged or ruined nearly 6,000 structures, and left 228 people dead in the city alone. Months later, schools, hospitals, electrical lines, and water pipes are still not repaired. As Mexico City digs out of the rubble, questions emerge. Could the loss of life and property have been prevented? And what are the man-made factors that contribute to a natural disaster? <laughs> to talk about these questions and more, we're very fortunate to have with us today Neoki Solano. Thank you so much for joining us on Interviews from Mexico. It's a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Naoki is a professor in the School of Architecture in the National University of Mexico. Naoki, I imagine you've been a busy man since September 19th. Yeah, I have been really busy, right, uh, since uh, it has been really uh, intense for, uh, since that. Since I then. bet. Yeah. <laughs> well, your job is to go around inspecting buildings in the city to check the safety levels and the degree of damage. We've seen that there's some parts of the city where there's a great deal of damage and where damage is concentrated, but also we see that there are blocks where you can have a building that's completely collapsed and then buildings on either side that are completely intact. Is there a common denominator for why some buildings fall and others don't? Well, actually, there are a lot of factors that we have to consider uh, before uh, the denominating well, something that it's one reason. I mean, there is no one okay. reason. I mean, there are many reasons. And it's uh, every 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 case is different, so there are many many factors that we have to consider first. Uh, we have to consider things like he height of the building, uh, the the type of land, uh, the the uh, the configuration of the building, the design, the design and the in the columns, the separation between buildings. I mean, there are a lot of things that we have to consider first, but certainly. The main denominator is the lack of application of the building codes uh, in the structure, in, in structurally speaking. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about. There's been a lot of talk about corruption being a factor here. How, from a technical standpoint, does corruption contribute to the destruction of lives and property in a natural disaster like an earthquake here in Mexico City in particular? Yeah, it, it contributes a lot. I mean, if authorities don't have the, the, the capacity to, to supervise and to check that all the buildings are built with a strict application of the, of, the build, of the codes, well, it is really likely that we could have problems in the future uh, with movements from the, in earthquakes. So are we talking about builders passing bribes under the table to cut corners? On, on some of the standards then, usually? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, uh, there, I mean, I cannot say it is a general practice, but certainly there are cases in where uh, these bribes or uh, even uh, neglect from the, from the authorities could be a determining factor uh, when it comes to, to buildings that were severely damaged, especially the new ones, which, uh, to begin with, they weren't supposed to be damaged with the, with the strict application of the codes. Do you, are you able to track this down? Are you able to prove these cases of sub substandard buildings as you go through your inspections? Yeah, actually, when, the, when, we, when we construct a building, we have to make some kind of a, of a lock, an activity lock. When we uh, consider everything, all that happens, how it was built, when it was built, by whom, uh, in what time, so there are a lot of things that we could track down in a building. Uh, that's what we are supposed to do as builders, as architects and engineers. But of course, there is a, sometimes this is not done. And mm. that's the problem here. And the authority actually doesn't have uh, the capacity to check that every single building in the city has it. So it's a little bit complicated. 
uh, let's not forget that we live in a, in a city with 22 million people yeah. in the metro in the in the suburban area uh, altogether. At least in the Mexico City area, we are at least like 8 million or 9 million. So it's a lot of buildings that we have to to take care of. Another factor that people have been talking about in the destruction that we saw on September 19th is that there were buildings that were actually damaged from the earthquake on September 19th in 1985 that were never repaired properly. Is this also a factor in the destruction that we're seeing now? Certainly. Uh, all buildings that were built before 1985 have uh, a, an increased vulnerability because the building codes back then were less strict than they are right now. Mm. So of course, when you have a building before 1985, uh, and especially with a certain type of a structure and level or, or number of the stories, uh, you have a, a, a vulnerable uh, factor in there regarding the structures. So we have to be really careful in that. Did you find any buildings in the inspections, for example, that were damaged and uh, should have been repaired and that that previous damage contributed to, to the buildings collapsing or having severe damage in this earthquake? Yeah, there are a lot of cases in the city. Uh, sometimes they were severely damaged, but uh, we have to be really careful in here because sometimes the building might look ugly or might look bad and it doesn't mean necessarily that the structure is damaged. So it's a, two, are two different things. Actually, there are cases when we have the structure intact, in good shape, but maybe the, the outside walls are damaged indeed, but that doesn't mean they are dangerous. And on the other hand, we have also the damage in the structure, and that would make them like uh, prone to be mauled. <laughs> so it really takes a, a professional inspection to know what the situation with, is with the building because of this situation where one can look perfectly fine and it isn't, and one can look pretty bad and it's really fine. You have been working on these inspections, and another one of the reports that's coming out is that there's a real backlog in terms of getting buildings inspected. In fact, you can walk down the streets here in Mexico City and see schools that are still closed because they're waiting for that inspection. And so basic services like schooling is unable to operate, and there may in fact also be buildings that are operating or inhabited that shouldn't be because of the degree of uncertainty. How is that backlog operating, and is it a problem still at two months since the earthquake? Yeah, certainly there are a lack of professionals in the area that are able to determine, uh, that are licensed indeed to, to, to say that a building is safe or not. Especially schools are really, really delicate because we have to, there are, ch there are children, there are children in there. And uh, we, so we have to be really, really careful. Actually, the Faculty of Architecture, we have been collaborating with educational authorities to keep inspecting schools specifically. And there is a program in, in that matter just for schools. Uh, mm -hmm. After the earthquake, of course, we had a lot of teachers, a lot of students that were um, uh, inspecting buildings, teams, professionals, but obviously at some point we had to go back to our academic activities. Mm -hmm. And still there is a group of professors and professionals in the School of Architecture that are uh, taking care of these cases, specifically schools. It's understandable why parents and, and students would be frustrated at how long some of these processes take. But in general, how would you assess the response of the government to the September 19th earthquake? Uh, certainly, it was, in my opinion, not good enough. Hmm. Uh, there was lack of a lot of personnel that was like ready for the situation. Certainly, we were not foreseeing the situation. Uh, a lot of uh, things have, have been done since 1985. Uh, in terms of be, uh, making building codes more strict. Uh, certainly a culture of prevention and, uh, and, uh, and the procedures of what to do in, in that case. I mean, you go out of the building, you don't scream, you don't run, you don't uh, push everyone else. You have the limited some security areas in, in outside. Uh, but there are other things that were not considered such as, uh, as uh, big, I mentioned damage in all the city, general damage everywhere. So, I mean, it's... You mean not just of buildings, but of roads, of infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, roads, infrastructure. Uh, if, uh, exactly, water, 
uh, gas lines, pipes, mm. uh, uh, all the, everything. I mean, all the infrastructure that makes the city work. Uh, we, we definitely the city is totally different from 1985, and yeah. we have more structure, more uh, more a uh, subway, more uh, services, uh, more spread everywhere. So it's quite a, a big challenge for the for the government to to be prepared for that situation. Well, I want to come back to this point of the government response and what lessons we can draw from this experience of this year's September 19th earthquake after a short pause. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here talking with Naomi Solano about the earthquake on September 19th here in Mexico City and what lessons can be drawn from this experience. From a technical point of view and also from a political point of view because we're talking about the response of the government and public policies to minimize the damages and the destruction, what can be learned from this natural disaster? Uh, the very first thing that we have to relearn <laughs> Mm -hmm. is uh, keep uh, supervising that uh, all the structure codes are applied strictly. And uh, the second is that we, we realized that we have lack of, uh, lack of culture of, in, uh, of insurance and, uh, to check everything is fine with their, with their structures to make, uh, re uh, to make assessments every once in a while with a professional, with an engineer or an architect to determine if the building is okay, if there hasn't been any anomalous behavior in the structure or something like that. Uh, we have to give another important factor is that people in Mexico don't give maintenance to their buildings. And that's really, really important because maybe you could have uh, foundations that need to be assessed every once in a while that they are not flooded or they are not in bad shape in which case you would have to make a strategy to to cope with that. <laughs> Is there a certain number of years or something that you should have a fairly thorough revision or inspection of your building to make sure it's doing fine? Um, every case is different. The, uh, it depends certainly on the, the dimensions of the building but certainly every once in a year or two uh, would be enough. Of course, if uh, a person sees something in his building that is not good or he feels uh, uh, not okay, well, uh, it's, a, it's a wake up call to, to do something. I mean, it, it, if it looks good, it's good. <laughs> One of the questions that's on everyone's mind since September 19th is will it happen again? And the answer from geologists is. Yes, of course. Is there anything besides what we've mentioned that we should do to be better prepared next time? I, I think um, we could be better prepared in other, in other dimensions of the problem, such as the legal side, uh, legal side of the problem, problem, and certainly the. As, I'm sorry, I already said this, but uh, to have buildings with insurances. Yeah. To, to, to cope with anything that could happen in the future. <laughs> Are you at all involved in legal cases in terms of some of the corruption that went into buildings falling in this earthquake? Uh, well, uh, me specifically or just... Or the, the school, yeah. Uh, been doing no, not in the school. Absolutely, it's not involved in these kind of things. Uh, we only limit ourselves to uh, research about the design. Providing the documentation. Pro providing the documentation, but certainly there is a lot of work to be done, uh, making an uh, inter multidisciplinary work with other, other, other specialists. Because in some of these cases, we could be talking about criminal responsibility. Of course, no? yes. Yes, we could be talking about that. Actually, there are a couple of cases. Well, I'm sure there are more than a couple uh, mm -hmm. where builders and uh, construction firms aren't directly uh, responsible uh, for for the loss of lives mm. in some cases or the loss of property so just yeah, certainly there is a lot of work to be done and there actually are not enough mechanisms to make them 
uh, responsible for that, I mean, to, to make an investigation. In the legal framework in itself. The, yeah, exactly. And also we have the problem of impunity. Even when there is a legal framework, we've seen in, in many areas of the law here in Mexico that there often is not prosecution, investigation, and sentences of cases. Does it appear that these cases are moving forward? Uh, um, there is, uh, I cannot say for every single case, yeah. but in some cases there is a more punctual following about the problem, and in others there isn't. But every case is different and they have their own uh, particular things, so I, I, really, I could not really say a uh, general uh, thing about that. Uh. It's, it's a real concern, I yes. know, for, mm. for many people and for the society in general living with this kind of risk. The residents of the city of Mexico, most everyone is deciding to stay. This is our home. This is where mm. we live. On the level of, of residents, is there something that homeowners can do to make their homes and their workplaces safer? Um, yeah, I mean, they, ha they could have a plan in case of. <laughs> That's a lot of help to begin with, to know what to do in case something happens and not to, to let things happen and then uh, look what to do. I mean, it's totally different. Or enter into prepared. panic. Which yeah, exactly, to panic, to be prepared for everything, for example, to have like your, your, uh, your plan with your family, okay, in case of earthquake, where should we meet, what should oh, we yeah. do, uh, which uh, parts of the house are safe, which aren't, maybe you have mm -hmm. a lot of windows, well, you don't go near your windows or you don't go near the, uh, I don't know, shelves or things that might fall, so you have to, to make uh, that would be my recommendation to to make a plan with your family and you working or the people that you work with in terms of overpasses falling or or roads being damaged because that was a major problem as well as there were problems with getting around the city and knowing where you could where you could drive through and where it was completely blocked off. Uh, well, as a, as a school of architecture, uh, we only make the research with the buildings, mm -hmm. uh, with that scale of constructions. The other scale, well, there are other authorities, other specialists that uh, they could be making some work about that. <laughs> so you'll analyze, for example, if a road is damaged or or uh, a pedestrian bridge has fallen, you analyze what the reasons were and how to avoid it, and then it passes on to the builders and the city government that's responsible for that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of responsibility that a lot of agencies and institutions have to be making, uh, working together to, to minimize all the effects of that kind of things, especially infrastructure. Infrastructure is really important because it's what makes uh, the city work and if you don't have infrastructure, you could have a, a, a potential, a really, really delicate uh, situation uh, threat over there. <laughs> well, we have a huge agenda for improving our preparedness and getting ready for the next earthquake, because everyone says it's pretty much inevitable here in Mexico City. Thank you so much for joining us, Neoki Solano. Thank you very much. And thank you. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico.